Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, first thing is I want to let everybody know uh, that we're doing the thing where we're keeping everybody on mute because we've had a, a little problem with Zoom bombers coming in and just being disruptive. So we're just going to unmute people if you have questions or comments or answers or ideas. And so throughout the night, uh, I'll try to remind everybody of that. Um, but again, just sort of let us know, let me or no know in that way, and then we'll unmute. Uh, apologies for that. Hope that nobody minds. Uh, otherwise, let's go ahead and get started. I'm MC Owens. This is the Dharma Doors. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight, we draw even closer to the conclusion of the sutra that we've been working on now for a while. However, I am going to take tonight to discuss a topic, and the topic tonight, by the way, is Samadhi, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this book in a minute, but that's the topic, Samadhi. So <clears throat> let's see. Um, so this is another one of those topics that I really should have discussed much earlier, it does occur in the sutra towards the end, but of course, there have been uh, mentions of samadhi, this sort of meditative concentration. There have been mentions of this throughout the sutra. And because this year in studying our sutra, because we've been focusing on the, bat, the bodhisattva path, I'm I'm kind of ashamed that I didn't talk about samadhi sooner because it's so important to the bodhisattva path. So better late than never. So we're really just going to talk about this idea of samadhi. I have a lot of different kind of ideas to share. I think, let's see. Well, I'll get back to it, but let's read it just briefly from the sutra. I'm not going to read a lot from the sutra tonight, but just at the end of the sutra, and this is after the Buddha has told us what the name of this sutra is. And the Buddha gave us a few different names for this sutra. And then that's where last week I launched into a whole, <laughs> a whole talk about uh, Manjushri sutras. After that, at kind of right towards the end of the sutra, it says, then Manju Shri, the Bodhisattva, immediately entered the samadhi of the Bodhisattva's emitting lights to reveal all dharmas as illusory. After he entered this samadhi, he caused the assembly to see all the Buddhas in all the incalculable Buddha lands throughout the 10 directions. I'm going to pause there, but I just wanted to kind of contextualize tonight. So at the end of this sutra, Manjushri enters a samadhi. And that samadhi has this kind of wild name and a wild description. So in order to sort of appreciate or even understand what they're talking about, that's where I decided, let's back up and just have a conversation about samadhi in particular so that we can understand how kind of weird that is actually. <laughs> I want us to actually understand how that is not normal. So if you didn't know, Samadhi is the name of the yoga game. <laughs> All the different traditions of yoga, whether we're talking about Ashtanga yoga, Asankhya yoga, Vinyasa yoga, Hatha, you name it, any kind of yoga. Yoga, uh, this Indian 
idea of psychophysical exercise, as they call it, this idea of doing yoga culminates in something called samadhi. What is samadhi? Well, I'm not going to make any claims that I know what a samadhi is, but I am going to be here tonight talking about it in a number of different ways. So, oh, by the way, let me refer to you back to your book, to this book. So this is a great book on the topic of samadhi. It's a little academic. It's by Stuart Sarbacker here. And it's just called Samadhi, The Numinous and Sessitive in Indo-Tibetan Yoga. It's a great book as far as it has, you know, a kind of a history of this word idea, Samadhi, the way it's used in Buddhist traditions, the way it's used not in Buddhist traditions. So a lot of my initial remarks tonight are going to come from this book. If you're familiar with Ashtanga yoga, the kind of what is also sometimes called Raja yoga, the royal tradition, the royal path in that way, you, if you're familiar with that, you will know that the Ashta Anga, the eight limbs, are these eight, you could call them practices, I suppose, disciplines, but there are these eight steps or practices in the Ashta Yanga, Ashtanga Yoga system. And that system culminates in the eighth limb, the eighth thing which is samadhi. You may also be familiar with the Buddhist eightfold path. The noble eightfold path is a similar eight step process. And interestingly, that culminates in what is called samadhi. Now, in particular, the Buddhists call it Samyak Samadhi, the right Samadhi. And I'm going to have a lot to say about that tonight regarding the idea of correct Samadhi. But what I want to say right now is, is that that idea that there's a correct way to do Samadhi, it kind of basically means that there's a lot of other ways to do Samadhi and the Buddhists sort of feel like there's a right way to do it. So I'm going to talk about that as well. If you're familiar with the Bodhyanga, the limbs of awakening, the Bodhyanga, the seven factors of enlightenment or the seven limbs of awakening, that's also a Buddhist tradition, you'll know that the sixth limb of awakening is also samadhi. So samadhi is pretty important here. And in some schools of thought, samadhi is the goal. Like that's what, what we're aiming for in a certain way. So as usual, I like to do the etymology of these words to start. I like to get a grounding in terms of, well, what does this word samadhi actually mean? Because it gets translated into English a bunch of different ways. The most common is concentration. I will probably defer to concentration as kind of a, a, the standard definition of it, but I want you to know that samadhi, samadhi doesn't mean concentration. Well, exactly. So this word samadhi is a two-part word. The first part of the word, sam, sama, as I often have mentioned in Dharma Doors classes, it's where we get the English word same from. It means a kind of equality, 
sameness, not different, the same. So that's sama. What about D? Now, when I was a student many, many, many years ago, I was taught that the, the root of this word is D, which is to see. I have since studied a lot more Sanskrit, studied a lot more Buddhism, and I have learned that that is not the root of that word. The root, the, the D part of this word, actually seems to come from the word dar. And dar, as you probably know, in Sanskrit means to hold, to have. It's the root of the word dharma, dar. So it's samadhar, samadhar. Samadhi is the, is the grammatical way to structure this word. But now we know, or at least I think I know, that the word means to hold as the same. So the connotation of samadhi is a kind of gathering together in order to hold as one, as the same. And that leads, leads me to mention another standard English definition of samadhi. Union. You will often see samadhi translated or at least interpreted as oneness or union. And that, that kind of vibes, that definitely checks out with the etymology as far as holding as the same. And so a sense of union, a sense of oneness. And you could even then sort of throw in there like, well, I guess if I'm gathering all of this together as one, then you could kind of think of that as concentrating, sort of. The thing for me about the word concentration, though, I don't know about you, but in English, that word is a little intense for me. It's kind of like I, I wrinkle or furrow my brow whenever I think of concentration. And that is not the vibe we, we want to be thinking about with samadhi. Because there's this sense of union or oneness which to me is a much more open feeling in that way, more, more broad, less narrow, whereas concentrated is a little narrow for me. Again, this is just the way English sounds in my ears. So those are your options, union, oneness, concentration, holding as the same, or we could just use the word Samadhi. <laughs> so that's your that's our general definition of this. Let's dig a little deeper. So the first thing from the outset that we know is that we're kind of talking about meditation. <laughs> like that's the general world that we're in. But this is where things start to kind of diverge very, very quickly. And what I mean by that is that in some traditions, if one was in a state of samadhi, they would basically have their eyes closed. They would be in some sort of meditative posture and they would effectively be in some state of sensory deprivation, meaning that they have gone so far inside or what have you, like in terms of calming down, that there's this experience of oneness, experience of, of unity. But from the outside, what that would look like is someone sitting there with their eyes closed. <laughs> And then they would later tell you, oh yeah, I was in samadhi. 
I was in a state of union. I was in a state of oneness. So that's sort of one way that samadhi is understood. It's a state of being, a meditative state of being. Okay, but there's a little bit or a lot more to it than just that. So I'm going to sort of now move just into talking about samadhi in Buddhism in the Buddhist tradition. So in the Buddhist tradition, we, as we know, we could speak about an early Buddhism, right? That kind of more uh, Theravada, Hinayana, early type of Buddhism. And then as we usually do, we could also talk about a Mahayana type of Buddhism. And we could even get fancy later on and talk about a Vajrayana type of Buddhism. So those are the typical three divisions of the types of Buddhisms. Let's start with the earliest form of Buddhism. So in the earliest form of Buddhism, samadhi was definitely a meditative state. And in many Buddhist traditions that use that, tra that school or that tradition, that's what samadhi is. It's a meditative state. But it's a particular meditative state. And basically, as you may know, Buddhist meditation is divided into what are called the four dhyanas, the four jhanas, if you're using the Pali language. And if one is good and very comfortable at accessing these states of meditation called jhanas or dhyanas, it is from that world of dhyana, it's from there that one then gains access to a state of samadhi. I'm going to have a lot more to say about all this, by the way, I'm kind of laying this out in layers. So we're going to keep going deeper as I, as I make these passes. So I want to now sort of take a step back from the, these ideas of dhyana, meditation, and all of that. And I want to kind of lay a, again, lay a foundation here, but it has to do with this idea of union or oneness. So if we understand samadhi, as a state of union or oneness, there's something, a couple of things actually, that we could deduce from that. And what I'm getting at is this. As you probably know, the Buddhist tradition is very, very interested in dealing with what are called the three kleshas, the three poisons. This is about desirousness, a wantingness, this kind of raga, this attraction. It's also about dvesha, about aversion, anger, bitterness, resentment. And it's about moha, confusion, delusion, ignorance. I want to focus for a minute just on desire and aversion. And, and again, remember that aversion in Buddhism, like being averse to something, is akin to being angry at it, like not wanting it. Sometimes we are so averse to something, like we don't want it to exist. We are we are ready to like bring it out of existence. So there's animosity, hatred in built into that idea. So this is what I want to start with. If you think, if you are on board with the Buddhist kind of program, and by on board, I mean, you're interested in controlling that desire and controlling that aversion. 
if you're a practice practitioner and you're interested in those, then check this out. I want you to be thinking about how one can really only be desirous of or averse to. You can really only be attracted or averse if there is what we could call the subject object relationship. Because it is someone who is desirous of that thing. I want that. Which means I don't think I am that. I don't think I have that. But I think if I could have that, it would, it would make me happy. So I want it. So I want you to notice how desire and attraction, it only works if there's a me and an it. Likewise, anger only works if there's somebody to be angry at something. In other words, if one were in a state of samadhi, a state of union or oneness, there would be no room for desire or aversion. It, it would be impossible because it just it does not compute. And so if you ever want to know, am I in a samadhi? You could ask yourself, well, do I want something? Am I angry about something? If so, you're probably not in a samadhi. Whereas if you are in a state of contentment where you don't need anything whatsoever at all, and you're basically kind of chilling, and so you're not angry or averse or pissed off at anything, if you're feeling like that, meaning content, I don't need anything, content, I'm not angry or upset about anything, you might be getting close to a state of samadhi. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there as a kind of a starting point or a way to think about a samadhi from a Buddhist point of view. So what I mean is, is that Buddhism, yeah, they're interested in meditation. They're interested in deep, profound states of meditation. But all of that is an exercise to deal with the three poisons, to deal with being overly stimulated, overly attracted, overly desirous, and being overly averse, overly angry in that way. And so we are, we, there are techniques, there are processes for basically eradicating the poisons. And so one of the techniques is to do meditation. And just to sort of you know, present my understanding of meditation from a Buddhist point of view, meditation for me is the practice of being content. The practice of being satisfied with just being. Not needing anything. And again, not really wanting not to be worked up about anything. And so it's about calm breathing. It's about focused attention. It's about trying to, in a way, slow the mind down, not trying to multitask, not trying to entertain 10 different ideas at once, but actually trying in a way not to think about anything at all. And so if you can sort of let go of in that way, externals, let go of needing anything for the moment. I don't need, I don't need to watch anything. I don't need to listen to anything. 
I don't need to be eating anything. I don't need to be taking a bath or a hot shower. I can just be being. If one is in that mode, that's how you get into these states of dhyana. Now, again, I'm going to have a lot more to say about the specific states of dhyana as they pertain to samadhi, but I just wanted to kind of, again, lay out that kind of litmus test for like being in a samadhi or not being in a samadhi. Well, one defining characteristic of being in a samadhi is the dissolution of the subject-object relationship. Not feeling that you are here in a world of objects and things, but again, something closer to that sense of oneness or unity. All right. Okay. Are you doing okay with this? We're, again, we're really just starting out slow. Okay. So next up, I want to talk about dhyana specifically, because like I said, in the Buddhist tradition, and by the way, this is true of Ashtanga yoga as well, you can really kind of only access a state of samadhi via a state of dhyana. It's again, it's part of the Ashtanga system that that's you, you get into a dhyana, then you get into samadhi. And it's basically the same in the Buddhist, the early Buddhist tradition. So what's up with dhyana then? So we got to have a little, little talk about dhyana first before we can really get to the deeper ideas about samadhi. So I, I've been wanting to share this idea for a while, and I just, it just never seemed, uh, never happened. <clears throat> so here you go. When, how can I, I actually, yeah, I haven't, I haven't said this yet. So I'm trying to figure out which comes first. <clears throat> so one interesting thing about dhyana. <clears throat> so you may know from my talks or other talks, you may know that to be in a state of dhyana, or again, jhana, as it is in the Pali language, in the Buddhist tradition, to be in a dhyana is to be in what is called the realm of pure form, which is distinct from the kamadhatu, the realm of desire. That's that realm of, ooh, give me that. Urgh, get away from me. The realm of desire is the realm of give me that and get away from me. That's the basics of, of that. There's obviously a lot more to the realm of desire. But through sati, through mindfulness, one enters just the realm of pure form. I will have a lot to say about the realm of pure form in a minute. But I want to tell you about something interesting. In traditional Indian cosmology, there are, well, there are always these three gods. The Godhead, the Godhead is always uh, three. But I want to talk specifically about the God of the realm of desire. So cosmologically speaking, there is a, a God, a, a deity that governs the realm of desire. And that God is named Indra or Chakra or Chakra Devanam Indra. Chakra like has all these wives and is famous for being able to make love to all of his wives at once. Chakra has all of these uh, servants that basically just like shower Chakra with 
sensual pleasures. So chakra, as far as the realm of desire goes, Indra, chakra Indra is the god of desires, the god of the realm of desires. Whereas the realm of pure form is governed by a god named Brahma. So what's up with Brahma? Well, I wanted to tell you an interesting story from my life. It goes all the way back to, oh, I was undergrad. I was an undergraduate studying religion. Um, I hadn't really focused exactly on Buddhism yet. So I was still taking all of my general courses. And I took a course on Hinduism, or what at that time it was just a course on Hinduism. And the professor who taught the course on Hinduism, great professor, he eventually became one of my advisors, a guy named Robert Foreman. And I remember distinctly. Bob Foreman, my advisor, telling me about Brahma. And it, it, it's a lesson, and it wasn't even in class. Again, he became my advisor. We kind of even became kind of friends in that way. And that, so it was just in a kind of more personal conversation with him. And he was telling me about Brahma. Now, he is is i haven't spoken to him for a while but he is kind of like a hindu like he um is kind of a believer if you will in that so or at least he he operates in the mythology of indian cosmology and he described for me one day brahma and the way that he described it was he described it as, and I, I, I'm, I'm not actually going to tell you exactly how he described it. I am, by the way, but I want to share with you my actual experience of Brahma, because when he told me about Brahma, I was basically like, oh, I've experienced that. So what he told me was this. It was about this experience that I've had in meditation. And it's the experience where, the, for me, the first kind of sign of it is that everything gets very quiet. Like a little abnormally quiet in the sense that I, like there has to be some noise <laughs> there's got to be like street noise there's got to be something but as i'm sitting in this state of meditation i feel like i can't hear anything like again that it's just very quiet and then Shortly after that, or right along with that sense of, wow, it's really quiet, I have this feeling or this sense that time has stopped, that it's almost like there's nothing moving. It's almost like it's still, it literally, like they always talk about stillness, but it's a moment of stillness and quiet in a very kind of very peaceful but again in a very almost abnormal way where like <laughs> like what's exactly going on my friend professor advisor bob foreman basically once told me that's brahma that 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 
And I remember he kind of kept saying that, which was, it wasn't that Brahma is the silence, not the stillness, but that. And, and that's where, by the way, there is a, um, there's a sense, there's a sense in which Brahma is that, that that word, that Sanskrit word Brahma, there's a sense in which it's almost onomatopoetic, that it, it, that that Brahma is the word for that, and that it, it is that. <laughs> I, I know I'm sounding whatever, but I want to. It, it is this sort of in, intangible, ineffable, and that's what they would describe Brahma as. But what I'm trying to convey to you is the feeling of Brahma, not what Brahma is or isn't, or a, is it a god, but just that there's this sense that you're probably in the realm of pure form if you're in that still state where things seem quieter, if not totally quiet, if things seem still. There's also sometimes for me a feeling that my uh, respiration has stopped, <laughs> that I'm not breathing anymore, but I don't need to either. Like stillness, total stillness. So that's the way that Brahma was described to me. And that's the way that the realm of pure form was described to me. And that's the way that being in a dhyana was described. But again, I was having these experiences. I was just given words for the experience I was having. So that's Brahma who's in the realm of pure form. By the way, any questions, comments, answers, ideas so far about that? Yeah, no. Um, I, it kind of feels like, I know you don't want to get too much into specifics, but or like who is Brahma or what is Brahma, but it kind of feels like Brahma is the realm of pure form. Mm. Is, mm. is that kind of how you're describing it there? Yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to say when it's like that almost that quietness is Brahma. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Now, to say that, to speak of Brahma in that way is a little more Hindu than it is Buddhist. Because the Buddhists are sort of, well, they're not so uh, theistic as we know. So they are definitely thinking of Brahma more as a, like Noam said, or like we were saying, kind of more of a state than a being in that way. So, all right. So all of that then leads me to say that Samadhi is understood in the Buddhist tradition to be in the formless realm, not the realm of pure form, but the formless realm. The formless realm, of course, has no form. <laughs> and when we say that, what we mean is the, in, the for, in the formless realm, there is no visible forms. In the realm of pure form of Brahma that I was just describing, there is very much visual phenomena. There is very much a sense of I'm in my uh, room or I'm in the zendo or I'm wherever I am, but it's a lot quieter than it used to be. It's a lot more still than it used to be, but there is still visual phenomena. Even though I can't hear anything in that state of Brahma that I was just describing, there's still an awareness that I'm not hearing anything. Whereas in the formless realm, there is understood to be no sounds 
period, and certainly not even the awareness of the lack of sound. My point is, is that the formless realm has nothing to see, nothing to hear, nothing to smell, nothing to taste, nothing to touch. And because there's no stim sensory stimuli going on, it allows for the discursive, contemplative mind, it starves that mind of stimuli. And so eventually there isn't even thinking going on in a state of samadhi as it's traditionally understood in the early Buddhist tradition. All right, so now we've made a few attempts to talk about samadhi <laughs> very, very simply in terms of the language, the etymology, a kind of basic idea of meditative sense of oneness and union, and then an even deeper sense in which, oh, it's like there's the realm of desire and then this quiet realm of Brahma, and there's even beyond that. That leads me to my next topic. So I'm going to make an attempt here. And I feel like everybody, I, you know, I know most of you in the, in the room tonight, um, this is going to be a very personal um, uh, description. And I'm ho I hope everybody enjoys this. It's something I've been thinking about for a little while. And I'm going to sort of do I'm going to attempt to do something interesting, which is I'm going to now use an analogy. And everybody knows that I love using analogies and similes, right? So I'm going to be, I want to use an analogy for samadhi. And there's a way in which I am going to be literally talking about samadhi, but I'm also speaking metaphorically analogously and what i'm getting at is is that i want to try to talk about the samadhi of skateboarding so many of you might know i'm a skater <laughs> i love skateboarding and i have been skateboarding for my parents say actually that I was skateboarding before I could walk, that I literally would scoot around on my sister's banana board before I could actually even walk. They say that. I like to think that's true. So it's a very deep part of, of me and kind of, you know, my life in that way. And I definitely feel like there's a comparison to be made between states of dhyana and samadhi and skateboarding. So if you're not a skater, I hope you can follow this because I'm going to get a little geeky or nerdy when it comes to skateboarding in that way. But it kind of begins, it begins for me very personally, it begins with a sense of freedom. And what I mean is, is that when I first started uh, in, you know, more like when I was 12, 13, when I first really started learning how to skateboard, what really attracted me to it was this really beautiful sense of freedom that I felt when I was doing it. As a kid or as a child, there was definitely, of course, this sense of freedom from my parents. Like I'm, I'm on wheels. <laughs> I'm, I'm gone, right? So there was definitely that sense of, of liberty in that, in that way. But I really do remember, sort of the, the feeling of. Well, I guess it would be that feeling of Brahma a little bit. And what I mean is, is I remember, and it still happens now, it's why I still do it, that when I'm doing it, 
it's all I'm doing. And this has a lot to do with the very nature of the skateboard, which is there, there's a there's a very kind of famous saying in the world of skateboarding, which is that for most people, their first time on a skateboard is their last time on a skateboard. <laughs> most people step on it and instantly go, whoa, that is incredibly dangerous. I'm not going anywhere near that. Wisely so in that way. But for me, that was all the more attractive, like the kind of the challenge of it. But my point is, is that to do it, like to successfully skateboard requires focus and concentration. And actually, usually it's when you lose focus or concentration, that's when you fall. That's when you get hurt. So it's an interesting way that just getting on a skateboard almost demands sati. It almost demands focus and concentration and a kind of being very present here and now. And so I would, I would suggest in my analogy that that sort of initial process of learning to skateboard is a type of sati, a type of mindfulness. And it is only by focusing and concentrating and doing it that you actually can then gain access to the freedom I was talking about, where you're not struggling so much anymore. You're not actually really like well, basically, you're no longer afraid of falling in that way. And it's when you reach that state of no longer fearing the falling that you can kind of cruise, as it were. And it's when you're in that kind of cruising mode, that's kind of like a dhyana. And what's interesting about it is, is that in the Buddhist tradition, they describe four states of dhyana and the initial state of dhyana is characterized by joy pleasure but a kind of rapturous pleasure in that way and again what i'm suggesting is that analogously it takes a while to get there if you're skating but once you get good at it, once you get comfortable at it, and once you're able to really just cruise, it's so joyful. It's so pleasurable in that way. So there's kind of a first dhyana of skateboarding. But again, I want to kind of go back to that idea, though, that when you're in that mode of cruising and being joyful, at least for me as a young man, I was not thinking about uh, my homework. I wasn't thinking about school, the parents, all of that. I was just the doing of this beautiful thing. Now, the second stage of dhyana is where they say that that rapturous joy subsides. But there is still a discursive awareness that this is very pleasant. And the idea is, of course, is that that, that rapturous freedom, it, it doesn't always last in that way. But it's because we've moved on. And as you skateboard more, it's no longer about trying to get that rapturous bliss, it is about a kind of contentment, a kind of pleasure in that way. And so that's the second jhana of skateboarding, I would say. <laughs> An interesting thing about the third jhana, and by the way, in the Buddhist tradition, the third and the fourth jhana 
there's a lot of um, like back and forth with those. So I'm sort of just talking about the upper levels of dhyana, third and fourth jhana. But one of the characteristics about being in the upper jhanas is they talk about a transcending of both pleasure and pain. That is one of the characteristics, and it's when you approach equanimity, which is the fourth jhana, it is characterized by actually no longer really caring about pleasure, but also no longer caring about suffering, pain, and all of that. It is this equanimous point between pleasure and pain. And what's interesting is that as a skater who has broken many a bone, I can tell you that when I broke them, I really couldn't tell you if that was a pleasant or a painful experience. It was something that happened. It sucked because I couldn't keep skating. <laughs> but, and now I, I don't know, you know, you know, the more scientifically minded will say, oh, it's about endorphins and it's about things like that. Sure, fine. <laughs> but the idea is though, is that a num you know, a number of years ago, I think it was about five years ago, I was having one of those beautiful days skateboarding. I was all by myself in a skate park and I took a bad fall. I broke both my arms and both my wrists at the exact same time. And I was at the bottom of the, the, the concrete uh, pool laughing, laughing. I was laughing because I was all alone and I didn't know how I was going to get home or how I was going to do anything. Like I thought that was funny, but the actual bodily sensations were just bodily sensations. I, they, they, it wasn't, again, it wasn't like pleasant or painful in that way. So that's an interesting correlation in that way. And then again, finally, you get to the fourth top of the dhyana, which is equanimity. I don't want to actually exactly say that skateboarding leads to equanimity. I do think that there is a degree of, of that kind of pleasure that leads to just contentment, that just leads to a sense of being that is there, but there's actually one other more interesting thing for anybody out there, again, who has skateboarded or knows skateboarders or whatever. There's a very interesting thing about skateboarders. And what it is, is, and it, it's so interesting. So if you remember, I was telling you that to be in a state of dhyana is to be in the realm of pure form. And when we talk about the realm of pure form, we're talking about a mind that, for example, would just see the size, shape, maybe color a little bit, but wouldn't be talking about how beautiful it is, how desirable it is, or even what it is. The realm of pure form is this realm of just shape, size, and things like that. Well, one of the beautiful things about skateboarding to me is that you start to see the world differently. And specifically what it is, is that you're looking, how can I skate that? How could I skate that? And I'm, I'm speaking about what they call street skating, of course. But what I mean is, is that the eyes of a skateboarder tend to be in the realm of form. 
where they're really only interested in a curve, a line. And it doesn't matter if you think it's a bus stop, if you think it's a, a set of stairs and a handrail. It, to a skateboarder, it's about the form, the shape. And it's a very interesting way of seeing the world when you're not seeing it in terms of its social conventions, not seeing it in terms of like the way society would use it, but actually being able to just see the form. And I would kind of suggest that that's maybe from spending a lot of time in these Dionic realms when you're skateboarding that you just start to operate in that realm of pure form. Okay, if you're following my uh, skateboarding analogy up to this point, we are still just in the realm of dhyana, and we've kind of moved through the four dhyanic stages of skateboarding. What are the, what's a samadhi of skateboarding? Well, let me first tell you what the official Buddhist understanding of the four stages of samadhi are. Officially, what the Buddhists talk about is that the first stage of samadhi is the realm of pure space, infinite space, infinite akasha, vast open awareness, they would say, just openness, right? That's space, openness. The second samadhi is infinite consciousness, just consciousness. The third level of samadhi is actually absolute nothingness. No space, no consciousness, nothing. What they call akimchanya, absolute nothing thereness. And then if you could make it through that, you get to what's called the state of neither perception nor non-perception. So I want, before I even go any further with my skateboarding analogy, I wanna make one thing very clear. I am only talking analogously meaning I am not encouraging anybody to go skateboarding in order to meditate. I'm not encouraging anybody to skateboard because I'm saying that's the only way you're going to get into a samadhi. Nothing like that. I really just trying to give us a way to think about what these states of mind could possibly be. And all the while, as I'm doing this, meaning the next part of my talk here, I want to make it very clear that I don't actually think this is the best way to do dhyana or samadhi because I do understand the benefits of seated practice. And what I mean is, is that I wouldn't even encourage jogging meditation to get into dhyana or samadhi, which I know many people teach a kind of jogging meditation nothing against it, but I'm just saying that I'm only talking analogously. Mainly because well, let me let me give you my analogy. I'll give you my my some this is the official Samadhi of skateboarding now. So once you've been skating for a while, like I was, like I have been, eventually you may try something very difficult. What I'm thinking of is, is something like what, what a skater would know as if you were like skating a 10 stair. So 10 stairs is big. Little three, little four, little little set of four steps, and you're like, whoop, you know, flying off, 
you know, it would require a little bit of concentration, a little focus, not to, you know, not to fall and all of that. But once you get up to like 10 stairs, things change. Now, I, back, back in my heyday, I used to skate 10 stairs. And I was even the type of person that would jump up on the handrail. And I would do a, a board slide on a handrail. That was like my biggest, greatest claim to fame was I board slid it. I board slid 10 stairs once and, you know, many times, but that was like the peak. So let's say you're a skateboarder and you are going to try to do that. Well, that's going to take a lot of focus a lot of concentration. And I'm not just talking about Diana. No, I'm talking about something a little more intense than that. And so let's say that you were going to get up the, the chutzpah, as they say, to, to try something daring like that. Well, the idea is, is that you're probably not going to land it the first time. <laughs> and so that first time is the scariest because you don't really know how fast you have to be going. You don't really know how high you have to ollie. You don't really know how this is going to feel. So you probably jump up and do a tester where you know you're not going to even try to land this but you still are really, really focused. There reaches a point though, and it usually is once you've tried this a few times, that you re, and it doesn't happen all the time, but it can happen, that you really start to feel a kind of connection with your skateboard. You really kind of start to feel like you're one with the skateboard. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, maybe again, because you've been skating so long and you've been trying this trick so many times, but there's a way in which you can start to feel as if the skateboard is just an extension of yourself, where you almost feel like you can move it at, as easily as you can move your hand, you can move that. And I would suggest that that level of focus, that level of concentration, where you are now, bo you know, boy, you are really not thinking about Monday morning at school. <laughs> You're really not thinking about your parents now. You are really just focusing on not dying as you, <laughs> as you hurl yourself down 10 flights of stairs, right? So that level of concentration where you are actually feeling a oneness with the skateboard, I would suggest that that is akin to a state of samadhi. Now, the thing about the official stages of samadhi that are about space, consciousness, nothingness, the thing about it is, is this. So in my analogy, I'm suggesting that that feeling of oneness with your skateboard is kind of like a samadhi, kind of like a samadhi. Now, it has happened to me maybe twice, maybe twice. But if you, um, if you listen to uh, especially professional skateboarders, you will often hear about a phenomena. It's actually so spoken about that it is a very well understood, or it's not understood, but it's a, it's a common phenomena that skateboarders talk about when they are trying very, very difficult tricks. They call it the blackout experience, where 
they're pushing, they're pushing, they're moving up to the set of stairs, they're moving up to the handrail. And then all of a sudden they're at the bottom skating away. And they don't remember doing the trick. That definitely sounds like the samadhi state of nothingness, where you are effectively blacked out. And the basic, um, the basic science of it, as understood by skateboarders, is that you basically move into pure instinct mode. And your, your cognitive thinking mind has to shut off. And that way, the body just protects itself. It just performs. <laughs> And then once everything is safe, the mind comes back online and we're thinking again. Again, I would suggest that that is very similar, if not the exact same thing as that third level of samadhi, the being blacked out or the state of nothingness. But I would want to say it once again, I would not recommend anybody try jumping down 10 stairs in order to gain a state of samadhi like that. Cause that's, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of, of risk just for a few microseconds of samadhi. But if you understand the analogy that I'm putting out here tonight, it might then pique your interest that it that the buddhists and the yogis they are talking about a way that the human being can calm themselves into that exact same state of being first a joyful rapturously blissful calm state of being and then even further into a state of being totally not cognitive. But I want to say this really clearly, though, about my skateboarding analogy. Someone who's on top of a handrail performing a skateboard trick, we could arguably say that that is like peak human experience. Like that is athleticism. At, oh, and by the way, of course, there are many athletes that describe blacking out. They describe running the marathon and basically blacking out, and then they're, 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 they won. And they don't remember the last half of the race. So again, my point is, is that when I describe the samadhi of akimchanya, the samadhi of nothingness, when I say that it's kind of like being blacked out, I don't mean like you've had too much to drink and you're <laughs> like blacked out on the couch. I'm talking about a state of peak performance, a state of flow state, right? A flow state of absolute perfection like you are at your finest and you are actually so at it that the mind has just actually checked out but again imagine being able to get into such a state without jumping down a flight of stairs imagine being able to just calm yourself into such a state and that leads me to the fourth and final state of samadhi, that state of neither perception nor non-perception. And there is another phenomena that happens in skateboarding. It's also a phenomena, by the way, that happens. Um, I've, I've actually had this experience both in skateboarding and in playing music, um, in, in playing an instrument. One way that you could think of the samadhi of neither perception nor non-perception. So when they say 
the samadhi of neither perception nor non-perception. They're talking about samnya, by the way, the word is samnya. It's one of the skandhas. They're talking about sensory perception, seeing with your eyes, hearing with your ears, nose, tongue, body, or um, cognitive cranium encased brain. So meaning perception this way. In the fourth samadhi, there is no perception. But it's also not the state of nothingness. It's not without perception. And one way that you can think of that is the experience that skateboarders have, musicians have, athletes have, of actually viewing the event from outside, not experiencing it from between the ears and behind the eyes, like not from on top of the handrail, looking down at the skateboard, but as if you're a spectator on the side, watching it happen. That could possibly be the samadhi of neither perception nor non-perception. I've heard it described that way, not even talking about skateboarding and musicians and all of that. I've just heard it described that way by, by yogis, where they're like, yeah, it's just basically a state of being outside of your body. What we call, what we have a great English word for it, ecstasy. If you didn't know, of course, that word ecstasius. Ex means outside. Stasis means to stand. Ecstasius means to stand outside. So the, the word ecstasy could potentially be the state of neither perception nor non-perception in that way. Now, I'm talking about literally the feeling of being outside your body, looking out or looking this way. Again, I'm just putting out as possibilities, ways of thinking about human experience in that way. And so, again, I would suggest that that level, that fourth level of samadhi, where you are potentially in this ecstatic state of viewing it from outside, if I'm talking about skateboarding, I want you to then kind of think, wow, like that doesn't sound easy. <laughs> like that doesn't sound easy to get into that state. It sounds like it requires a great deal <laughs> of focus, concentration, practice, and all of that. And my point is, is that my analogy of the skateboarding, one of the reasons why I wanted to, cr to, sorry, to create this analogy is I wanted to sort of, um, how, how could I say, I wanted to put a little respect on samadhi, <laughs> that it is a very special state of being that it is not like, just like, I'm going to do, I'll get into a samadhi tonight. It actually is something that seemingly requires a great deal of practice, a great deal of focus and concentration. And it's not something that just sort of happens. It's something that one needs to actually kind of work at, both in skateboarding and in meditation in that way. So... All right, so that's, I have a, one more thing to say, but I wanna hear any questions, comments, answers, ideas about the samadhi of skateboarding. <laughs> Anybody? Cool. Hmm. So the one quick addition that I wanted to make to, well, these 
really, um, yeah, Noe. Oh, you got him, Noam? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I love the metaphor. I love this, okay. this, the thing uh, for different ones. Uh, what comes to mind, Michael, is the ecstasy when I'm dreaming and I see myself. <laughs> mm. The ecstasy of of perceiving myself in a dream state, and like, oh, there, that's me. That that's me doing this thing from the outside. It was just a curiosity that came up. Is that dream states? There are times when I'm looking at myself. Mm -hmm. you know and there are times where i'm looking at myself looking at myself because mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's a dream and and you know so there's that fluidity of of that you mentioned that emptiness that empty space or the nothingness space you know which is what i achieve when i sleep mm. I, I'm, yep and i wake and, and fortunately i wake up <laughs> <laughs> which i did today and it was like lovely to have nothing, hmm. no desires, no no wishes, no dream, no no any desires, any wantings, anything like you've described, and then awaken to this dream state hmm. where there is where there I am, hmm. and I'm and now I'm there, and now I'm watching that, and then and then of course I wake up. Hmm. Um, curious i just wanted to talk you know bring throw that out there because it, it's not something is it something that i've worked at is it something i've worked on or is it something that's just perhaps because of the work i'm doing so to speak mm. quotation marks air quotation marks i do sit i do it is something that's on my mind it's entered into the subconscious into the dream states thank you mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Noe. I mean, you know me, I talk about the dream state and being in dreams often and use it also as an analogy for a lot of different things. I would throw out there one idea. So I, I want to go back to my kind of my opening remarks. I made this remark about how a samadhi is understood to be a kind of a sense of union. And in particular, what I mentioned was that if one is desirous of something, then that's a me and an it. And then there can't really be a samadhi happening in me and it. Also, if there's this thing that's making me angry, I'm probably not in a samadhi because there's that. My point is, is that if, if I'm skating towards my handrail to do my trick and I'm focused and I'm concentrated and I'm like getting into that samadhi of skateboarding so that I don't die and so I successfully do this trick. If while I'm cruising along, something catches my eye and I get distracted, <laughs> ah, <laughs> I'm going to lose my samadhi. So I wanted to remind you that we're talking about that kind of subject object or kind of that. And so my point is, is that I hear you about the the sense of being maybe outside oneself in a dream and this and that. So in that dream, I would just want you to think about or be curious about how, how distractible is that mind in that dream? Is that mind going to, like, is a bird, a dream bird going to fly by and we're going to be, ooh, what's that? And if that, <laughs> if that mind in that dream is very distractible, I would suggest that then that experience of being outside oneself is because in a dream you 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 can do that. So I would I would look more to the distractibility of that mind. And and then 
again, say if if you're being like, oh, what's that? Oh, what's that? You might not be a in a deep samadhi in that sense. Okay. Um, just one last point that I wanted to make about about the samadhi of skateboarding versus meditative samadhi. So an idea that I haven't spoken about much at all, and I plan to speak about it a lot more in the future, in the world of Buddhism, there is an interesting idea. It's an interesting thing, I guess you would call it. It's something that they call a kashana. So K A N A Kashana. And what a Kashana is, is it is a measurement of time. A Kashana is actually in the Buddhist slash Hindu tradition. The Kashana is the smallest measurement of time. It is said to be around 1 48th of a second. I've seen different measurements for, I mean, for comparing it to a second. There's a really great analogy though. They talk about in the, in the Buddhist slash Hindu tradition, they talk about how there is this, um, this silk, it's a, it's a very special silk thread. And it's not even a type of silk that is from earth. It is a silk of the gods, a, a silk of the devas. It's what the devas, it's what their celestial clothes are made out of. This incredibly, incredibly fine silk. Now, what they say is, is that there is a strand of this fine silk and there is an Asura, a Titan God that has a Vajra sword, meaning it is the sharpest sword that you could possibly find. What they say is, is that a kashana is basically, or actually it's not even that. What they say is, is that the time that it takes for that Vajra sword to cut through that super fine piece of silk, there basically have, have elapsed many, many, many kashanas. Just in that brief amount of time. Now, the thing about kashanas is that they are used, that, that particular measurement is used in the Buddhist tradition to measure time when you're in these upper, deeper meditative states. So what I mean is, is that what they talk about is, is that as the mind approaches samadhi, time, as I was sort of mentioning with my Brahma, time slows down for the meditator and things start to happen in kashanas. So in other words, they talk about becoming that the very... I'll put it to you this way. You know how an old um, old movie reel is actually a bunch of frames, but because that the, the reel is moving so quickly, you don't see the black spaces in between each frame, that the black spaces become imperceptible because it's moving so fast. They talk about that the mind of the meditator starts to see the, the gaps in between the frames of thought. And so they start, start talking about thought moments, kashanas. 
So the meditator is becoming aware of time happening at this incredibly, uh, uh, you know, quick rate in that sense. And the reason why I mention this is because in my skateboarding samadhi, the time that it takes to jump up on a rail and slide down it and go down, the idea is, is that there's many, 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 many kashanas, but for a skateboarder, they move through them and they're done. And so that's another reason why I'm not encouraging anyone to go skateboarding to reach samadhi, because it's going to, again, it's going to be a lot of effort for a couple of kashanas. Whereas in the seated form of meditation, you can actually be in a state of samadhi for many, 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 many kashanas to where it actually is a sustained state of being versus this flash of an experience in that way. So just wanted to mention that they do talk about the mind of the meditator slowing down to this Kashanic level. And ultimately in that sense, again, being able to see the gaps in between each thought rather than the thoughts being a contiguous stream of thinking like that. So, all right. I actually had a lot more to say about Samadhi, but I definitely covered the basis. So that's going to conclude tonight's talk. Um, we're not done with the sutra yet, so stay tuned till next week uh, when we will continue. So, all right. Unless there's any last comments, questions, answers, ideas.